What up guys, Cole here. And in this video, what I wanna talk about is two keys to scale to eight plus figures in revenue. So what I'm gonna share with you in this video comes from kind of two things. One is my own personal experience going from zero to 2.2 million a month in 17 months. And then the other is the fact that we do all of this high ticket, pretty high level sales consulting for bigger organizations. We've had the luxury of working with some big players out there. And a lot of our clients are at a high seven, multi seven or even eight figure level. And I'd say just approximately, we probably had about 30 plus eight figure clients or multi eight figure clients in the past two years. So what that's allowed me to do is kind of see the common patterns of what's made all of these companies successful and distill it down into kind of like a blueprint you can follow. And I wanna share with you two of the big keys I see time and time again with some of those most successful companies. So let's go to my screen here. And before we get into this training guys, if you want this document that's gonna have everything in terms of the two keys to scale to 10 plus million in revenues, then comment two keys below. And that way you have all of the resources you can review after you're done watching the video. And as you'll see, two keys to scale to 10 plus million in revenue. What we're gonna cover is the two keys to scale to 10 plus million. We're gonna cover six acquisition methods and the two believe you should focus on just starting off. We're gonna talk about why most businesses cap out and actually can't continue to scale and they stay plateaued. We're gonna talk about a simple shift in pricing in terms that can two or even three X your business. So this is like one of the most fun things I get to do with clients is a lot of times that you can just push somebody to change their price or even change the terms of how they present the price it can really ex result in some explosive growth in your business. We're also gonna talk about six ways to get more scale out of the same acquisition channel. So a lot of people, they start with one acquisition channel and then essentially what happens is they get capped. And we're gonna talk about six ways to expand that and get more out of everything that you already have. We're also gonna talk about one change in messaging that took a client of mine from seven to multiple eight figures pretty quickly. And then we're also gonna talk about how I 2X my ROAS with a single hire. So a lot of sexy things were to go on here. So. Let's uh, cover some key distinctions and get into it. So first of all, um, this model and the two keys I'm gonna share with you, they assume that you already have product market fit, okay? So in other words, this assumes that the market's already demonstrated that they're willing to pay for what you offer on a consistent and repeatable basis, okay? So this doesn't mean you made one sale. I would say you know, you made a dozen or a couple dozen sales, right? You like obviously have product market fit. And if you don't, I mean, that's the biggest thing always you're gonna have to tie down first is identifying an offer that one, has unique and differentiated messaging, so it has good positioning. Like, are you coming out to the market and you're saying something new, right? Or something that's unique and that's useful, okay? That is so, so big and I can't tell you, like most people just say the same shit as everybody else, right? It's crazy. So two, does it have scalable economics, right? With the pricing and your acceptable cost per acquisition and all of those things, are you going to be able to have like eight figure scale with that offer? A lot of folks, um, they just put their pricing model in a position where it just doesn't have the scale, okay? And then the third thing is scalable fulfillment and labor costs, right? So another thing is sometimes people are like buying up all day what you have, but the labor to fulfill on that, it, it puts your gross margin in such a bad position where you really have no like scale. Like you might get to 40K a month, but then you're tapped out with little profitability. So once you get there though, the first thing and the first key is to master one scalable acquisition channel, okay? This is gonna be a quick one. A lot of you guys already know this. And then the second one is gonna be really how to take this one to the next level as you'll see. But like I said down here, the most first most important thing that we wanna have to scale is one scalable acquisition channel. So that means when I say scalable, that means the more you input into the system, the more output that you get, okay? So most entrepreneurs, when, they, when they, they're starting off, they kind of think they have a little bit of a scalable acquisition channel, but they're doing like a combination of like, you know, they have a Facebook group and then it's organic, they have a YouTube channel, all of that stuff's great and you should do it for sure, but you need something to where you can like pull the lever and get more clients coming in, right? There's a direct correlation between inputs and outputs, at least at first. I find that the easiest way to start off, okay? So while like you might get consistent traffic from your YouTube channel, your Facebook group or whatever, it's hard to really like, you know, put fuel on the fire, so to speak there. It's hard to like pull the lever and then double the amount of output that you get. And I'm gonna share with you some channels where you can get that in just a second. So what are some scalable acquisition channels? Um, one of uh, my buddies, Alex Ramosi, he released a video on his channel, you should go check it out, where he talks about six of them. And I thought this is a really good way to break it down. There's paid traffic, 
pretty like, you know, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, Google ads, whatever. There's earned traffic, which is like this YouTube channel, right? So your subscribers on a YouTube channel, the following you have on Facebook, et cetera. There's owned traffic, which is like your house list and people you actually have the data for. There's manual outbound, so like an outbound sales team. Okay, there's affiliates, which means people who are adding your offer into their offer to make their offer more sexy, or they're just referring you people and getting an affiliate commission because of that. And then there's referrals, which is basically your client base referring folks to your offer and it's growing organically that way. So he has a great video on this. I would really highly, highly recommend um, checking it out. But there's two of these that I recommend you start with. Okay, um, and to be clear, Eight figure businesses can be built on all of these, okay? There's a lot of businesses that are eight figures that were built solely on referrals or affiliates or you know on own traffic or earn, earn traffic, okay? So all of these work, but I find for people who are probably watching this, which is online entrepreneurs, coaches, consultants, agencies, people who do done for you, high ticket services, stuff like that, I find two channels are the most effective. The first one is paid traffic, and then the second one is manual outbound. So to be clear, all of these can work, but I find paid traffic or manual outbounds usually the best to start. And then you add in some of this other stuff as you scale up further and you get more, you need more profitability and, and so on. So um, I put here, you know, I've had probably 30 plus eight figure clients in the past two years. And most of them, if not all of them, were solely focused on one of these channels. Okay, or at least that's how they started in the beginning. Okay, and that's because I like these the best because they're the most direct when it comes to inputs versus outputs. For instance, paid traffic, if you spend $1,000 on ads, if you're tracking correctly, you're gonna kinda know exactly what you're gonna get. Manual outbound, if you hire, if you have five salespeople that are within KPI, well, if you hire five more and they're all within KPI, you're gonna know exactly what you're gonna get. Okay, so they're the most correlated for inputs versus outputs, which I think it makes it the easiest to get that initial scale of your business, and then you can add a lot of these other things in, okay? So, um, again, I put here, best to establish those first and then build out the others. So, uh, what should you use? Let's, we narrowed it down to two. Should you use paid traffic or manual outbound? Here's what I think is paid traffic can work for both, for sure. It's deadly for anything that was a, there's a broad audience or more consumer based. So biz op, make money online, health offers, dating offers, like anything to do with like general self-improvement or spirituality, things like that, crush off ads. And they're, they're also very hard to work uh, outbound wise because it's hard to get a self identification of the person you're going for. It's kind of more of a psychographic than a demographic. Whereas manual outbound is a lot better in my opinion for B2B. Okay, so let's say you have a B2B offer that's 10K plus, and you can easily find your folks on like LinkedIn or Seamless.ai, um, Upleads, or any of those other typical um, lead sources, Zoom.info, there's a bunch, okay, built with all of those. So um, I find manual outbound definitely can work with paid ads, but if you have a higher ticket offer and you're selling B2B where you can find that person and just spear them and go directly after them through cold calling, cold email, cold LinkedIn, cold text, all of those channels, um, that can be very scalable and very effective. So for instance, um, we have like a biz op offer as one company in our portfolio, and that one solely runs off paid traffic, okay? Um, we do some of this other stuff up here, like we have earned traffic, we have owned traffic, we have affiliates, we get referrals, but the meat and potatoes is the paid traffic. Now our B2B, we do run some paid traffic, it works, but what's really something we're focusing on right now is building out our end-to-end -end manual outbound team. Okay, to take advantage of channels like LinkedIn or even built with, to actually go out there, send a cold email, cold call, get people on the phone and then set them to close. Okay, and it's just one of those things where with this B2B offer, the economics there just makes sense. And it's very easy to identify a qualified prospect. Whereas with paid traffic, that market is so small because we go after a very specific B2B entrepreneur that it's hard to get those people coming into like, let's say a VSL funnel. So. Again, this is not a hard science. I'm not saying if you're B2B, do outbound. If you're B2C, do paid traffic. Just kind of telling you at a high level what I've seen across a lot of our clients who are really successful. Let's move on to key number two, and this is where it's gonna get really good, is creating as much efficiency out of that channel as you possibly can, okay? So this is really how you're gonna to get to um, eight figures. A lot of people, they get the channel down and they're like, okay, I got somewhat of a scalable channel, but then they cap, and a lot of times it could be anywhere from 150K a month all the way to 500K a month. And I can show you kind of an example that's very, very common that I see with our clients all of the time of somebody who's capped with a paid acquisition channel. And I'm gonna show you six ways in which they can actually get more scale 
out of the same example, so or out of the same channel. So in this example, um, let's say this is a business who teaches Amazon FBA, so it's kind of like a biz op offer. Um, they're using paid ads as their primary channel. And a lot of times when they get to this point, I'll see their numbers and they're asking me, should they change their uh, offers? Should they change their market? Should they start a new channel? And again, a lot of times people just don't realize that they have the scalable channel already. All we gotta do is make that way, way more efficient, okay? So let's look at some of this data here. And just bear with me for a second. This is gonna be kind of boring, but this is really, really important stuff that's gonna help you, okay? So anytime I wanna diagnose and look at a business and diagnose the health and also what the constraints are and how I would scale, I look at what I call the marketing and sales value metrics, okay? So let's say this is last month's data. Right now it's like September 7th as I record this. So let's say this is August data. We wanna work, look at a full month of fully reconciled data of all of the downstream marketing and sales metrics. So let's say they spent 100K on ads, they had 300 availability, which means they had three closers who had 100 spots across the month available. Okay, let's just say for easy math, three closers, they each had 100 consult availability spots open across the entire month. We booked 325, but only 285 were approved, meaning we booked 325, but some of the leads weren't qualified and we had applications, so we, we, you know, we disqualified about 50 and we were left with about 285 which it means we booked about 95% of the availability. That's very, very good, okay? The channels, like we talked about, paid traffic, let's say YouTube ads, they're running to a VSL, they're doing some email, they're doing some Facebook group to supplement that. Now we had a show rate of 80% out of these um, 285, which means we had 228 show up. We made offers or demos to 200, 205, which means 90% were qualified enough to make offers to. And then we closed 51, which is a 25% closing ratio at the price point of 3,800. So that's contracted 193K. That doesn't mean we collected that. That means we have 51 closes at the price point of 3,800. Now on average, we only collected 67.3 upfront. Okay, so our upfront cash was 130K. So out of this 193K, we collected 130 upfront. The rest was like payment plans. So this means on average, we did a one pay, okay? The median of what we sold was a one pay, but we did some two pays or three pays, which brought it down to kind of 67.3. Um, in this example, we don't have a back end, and our total cash means our total upfront plus the receivables from months prior was 180K, which puts our cash return on ad spend at 1.8X and our net operating profit at 35, 35 grand because our labor is about 20%, 36 grand, 100 grand on ads, we already talked about that, that's 55% of the P&L, and our overhead is 5%. So let me ask you this. After seeing all of this data, what is the constraint in this business? Should be pretty obvious. The constraint is that the marketing expenses are 55% of the P&L, which means we talked about that scalable channel, we can no longer add more inputs and get more outputs if we change nothing, right? We lost the scalability. So the only thing we can do is make, we have to either have to do a new channel or we can make this system more efficient, which is the way easier thing to do. And that's what we're gonna do in this example. I'm gonna show you six ways to do that, okay? Just to reiterate this, I find this so common with people who are kind of at 100 to 400K a month, especially, okay? And so um, most times you'll wanna start a new offer, get into a new market, start a new business, get on a new channel. You just gotta kind of dig down and find out how you can make the system more efficient, which means you gotta add more skill sets and just get better. Like that's all it comes down to. So let's cover a couple ways you can do that. The first one in this example would be, I would look at the pricing, okay? Uh, really in any type of phone sales, high ticket world, 3,800 is relatively low. So automatically I'm thinking increased price. Now, the leading indicator of a price increase being available here is how high the upfront cash collections is. So anytime I see an upfront cash collection percentage above 50%, I know what we could do is increase the price, give more flexible payment terms, which means actually offer two, three, four pays. And then what's gonna happen is we're probably gonna get the same amount of closes, but our upfront cash percentage will go down, but overall we're gonna get more AR and the company's gonna be able to scale. AR is an account receivables. Now this is really important to think about because the thing is, is most people have a buying threshold at a certain monthly payment. They don't really look at the, the bigger amount. So imagine when you buy a car or buy a house, 
a lot of times people don't care about the terms or how long the payment is or the overall purchase price. They care about the monthly payment. So a lot of times, let's say if um, your offer is 5K, on average you collect, collect um, 2,500 upfront. So you have a 50% upfront cash collected. I've seen it to where literally you can um, just basically take 5K, bump it to 7,500 in price, offer a three pay, so it's still that 2,500 a month, and you'll have no decrease in conversions. So that's just profit out of thin air, which is amazing, okay? And so in this example, because this upfront cash percentage is so high, it's way above 50, I would immediately probably increase the price to 5,800, okay? And so that's something uh, in this example I would do. Remember this is a kind of biz op, like maybe start your own Amazon FBA type of offer. Let's look at some pricing benchmarks for all offers, B2B, B2C, everything all together. So for B2C, non-ROI, non I would look at 38 to 5,800 is a good target range. So if you're doing health, dating, spirituality, personal development, to where there's not a financial monetary ROI attached to it, 38 to 58 is where I really see um, you know, most people land in the premium space. Uh, I would say if you can get to 58, that's fantastic. I mean, I've seen higher than that, but at scale, 58 is about as high as I've seen with these. Not saying you couldn't do higher, just saying that's what I've seen. Uh, for B2C biz op offers, so like teach you how to do Amazon, teach you how to do drop shipping, teach you how to do an agency, become a coach, you know, all this stuff. Uh, 58 to 78 is what I see as a good target range, Some words up, sometimes upwards of 9,800, okay? A big stipulation in any sort of biz op space is once you get above 10K and, and there's a lot of financing involved, um, there, there's some, you just might run into some issues with FTC or people getting over, in over their heads. And you know personally, and for most people, I just don't think that's something I wanna be a part of. So I think uh, 9,800 as a max is good in those spaces. Not saying you couldn't do more, but just what I've seen. Now, um, B2B, or sorry, B2 solopreneur type offers. So this is like if you sell real estate agents, coaches, sales professionals, usually people doing about five to 15K a month in income, below 20 grand a month for sure. And um, they're, they're looking to scale up, they're looking to build out their business, et cetera, okay? So usually folks who are below 20K a month, coaches, consultants, agencies, real estate agents, insurance agents, all that stuff, 6,800 and 9,800 I find is a pretty good range. For agencies, um, this one's a little tricky, but I would say five to seven and a half thousand in the first 90 days is um, a good time frame. Typically I recommend packaging that all up front and then offering payment plans for the folks that need it but packaging it into like a bigger, more package, opposed to like month to month, if that makes sense. But it does break down to 1750 to 2500 a month. And um, with agencies, a big, big thing, honestly, is like backend and retention, right? If your retention's really good, which most agencies' retention's freaking terrible, but if yours is really, really good, you're gonna have a massive leg up in terms of spending, being able to spend money on ads to acquire customers profitably. It's not even gonna be funny. So uh, that's where I'd really focus here, but that's what I see for pricing. Now for true B2B offers, so you know, think about my offer, we help sales teams. And so typically our like lowest client might be doing 40, 50K a month, but offers like that, where you're going after real businesses, probably minimum 40 to 50 grand a month, all the way up to, you know, could be enterprise. For instance, 10 to 50K a month, or 10 to 50K as a price point is a, um, is a good range, okay? So that alone, and especially in this example, pricing alone, if they just did it and their closers were able to fulfill on that, would fix this entire funnel, okay? So let's move on to the second way, and that's to improve the ads or funnel conversion. Now I will say this is usually, especially in an ads-driven business to where you really scaled through ads in the beginning, most people will try to fix this first. And there definitely is opportunity here, and we're gonna cover that, but a lot of times people have already exhausted this avenue and they've yet to focus on the other things like pricing and a few other things we're gonna talk about. Well, we're still gonna cover this. So for instance, you're running paid traffic, there's probably incremental improvements you can make with CTR done through targeting, creative, or messaging, or landing page conversion rate, VSL conversion rate, the application conversion rate, how many people actually fill out the application in full, and the show up rate. So all those funnel downstream metrics, if you improve those, it does create a massive change. Okay, um, for instance, let's say you, do, you take your VSL conversion rate from 10% to 20%, you didn't just increase the throughput of your, of your acquisition funnel by 10%, you doubled the throughput of your acquisition funnel, right? Because 10 to 20, that's a factor of two. 
Okay, so if you haven't exhausted these options, they're really, really good. Now, I personally find the most people I work with, they've already done like everything they can do in terms of ads. They're like they're recording all these different creatives. They've tested 10 VSLs and 10 landing pages. Like they, they've done just like all of this stuff and really exhausted it. So in the case that you've done that, here's what I would also think about in terms of improving your ads. And the biggest thing is messaging and positioning. And I would really say that's 20% that drives 80% of the results with paid traffic. So most of the issue I found with ads is it comes down to people not having a broad enough messaging to really have the pixel catch traction and be able to optimize. Okay, so for example, if you market only to solar legion agencies through ads, you're gonna really struggle to be profitable at scale. Like you might get to 100K a month, but it's gonna be tough to get to an eight figure level. Just because simply there's not, that, there's not that many people out there in that market. And only a certain very small portion of your market is available on a certain channel like Facebook or YouTube, et cetera, okay? And so what you could do though is broaden out your messaging, which is going to dramatically increase the profitability and the throughput of the entire funnel, just because you're gonna give the ad platform more variability to work with. So you could go, if, let's say from solar agencies to all B2B agencies, or you could go from all B2B agencies to all beginner agencies wanting to get the five grand a month. Or you could go complete biz op, so an unaware audience, introduce agencies as a new opportunity, and then sell them on the new opportunity. So you see how I went from very, very specific to more broad, more broad, and more broad. Now, I've changed um, a lot of my clients' messagings to make them more broad, or even take it from specific to biz op. And I'm telling you, like, the ones that have, it's been an extremely explosive growth in their business. I mean, it, it works. Now, the caveat is that as you go broader and you essentially you go down market, the quality of the client goes down, okay? So what you're gonna run into is people who don't implement, they're not willing to pay as much, uh, they will complain about you online, you know, they'll, they'll attack your reputation, they'll, um, you know, they'll charge back, you know, you might have issues with the FTC, it's all these things. So it might sound like, you know, unicorns and rainbows just going biz ops, you have the world as your audience, but, it's, it's not as easy as that. And you're gonna run into a lot of issues. AR is really, really hard in terms of collecting payments. So your account receivables department gets very complex with BizOp. So it's something that it could be great, but it's not the, you know, going BizOp isn't the solution to everything. Okay, and a lot of people, once they realize this, they kind of get stuck on that. So I just wanna say that as a caveat, it's not the answer to everything. Um, if you do wanna stay very specific though, let's, let's say this guy who was doing solar agencies, he's like, no dude, I wanna just focus on agencies serving solar then really what you gotta do is instead of casting nets, as the analogy goes, you wanna throw spears, which means you wanna be able to create a targeted list of people you know is in your target market and then go after them with manual outbound and then make your retention and your back end as high as it can possibly be. And I'm telling you, I know multiple, multiple eight figure businesses that just target small niches like gyms or like dentists, like, I mean, small niches, but they're not totally relying on ads is the big thing. And they actually retain their clients, so they can afford more, they can afford to spend more on the front end. So uh, broadening out the messaging is a very, very good way to do it if uh, that fits your business. Another good way to increase your ads is creating a better hook or new opportunity within the ads themselves. So I see ads all the time, and I actually enjoy like getting on YouTube and like looking at the ads, as nerdy as that sounds. But one thing I just realize all the time is nobody ever says anything new in their ads. Um, a lot of times it's like the same old thing and you're just kind of putting the prospect in a pattern. And if anything, who you're going to attract is the lowest quality prospects because the highest quality ones have already heard all this stuff. So the key word here is new and unique, okay? And so the ads and offers that I've seen do so well create new opportunities within the marketplace, okay? So for instance, if you go out there and you say, uh, you know, coaches, consultants, and course creators, how to get five to 15 high ticket clients a month. Nobody's gonna listen to your ad except for like the worst low quality people who had just entered the market, right? Gonna be very, very tough, very saturated, banner blindness of a messaging like that is 10 out of 10. However, let me give you a, a client example. One of my clients is Alaric Hack. He's also one of my really good friends. And uh, he was marketing to coaches, consultants, and course creators. But two years ago, before anybody was on YouTube ads, at least in our industry, he started presenting, you know, grow your consulting business with YouTube ads. And so there was a built in new opportunity and new trend to that. And I watched his business go from 200 grand a month to over a million a month 
uh, extremely fast. And it was literally because he was presenting a new opportunity in the marketplace. Also, keep in mind, this guy had been on YouTube and running YouTube ads for over a decade. So, um, like the guy, you know, the product and the skill and the expertise, I mean, that's first and foremost, that's what's there. He's a beast at it, he's the best in the industry, okay? But also, at the same time, it was a new opportunity at the right time, okay? And that's what made his ads click so well and still to this day do so well. So, um, a lot of you guys might be thinking, okay, great, YouTube ads, you know, that, you know, it's kind of like a built in mechanism there. Because it's a new opportunity, but it's also like this new thing, like TikTok or like Facebook groups. All of those things can work as well. IG shoutouts is another new opportunity that's working right now as a mechanism for your offer. But um, what you can also do is you can also just reposition what you're already doing and bring out an aspect of it that's new. Okay, a lot of you guys have heard the Claude Hopkins story about how he was writing for Schlitz beer. And what he did is he went into the factory and he had them show them how he made the beer. And like he found this process that was like crazy. He's like, wow, they, you know, they, they put it through this barrel, then it filters down to here, and then they do this, and they put it in this tube. And they were like, the people at Schlitz were like, dude, everybody does that. And um, Claude Hopkins said, it doesn't matter if everybody's doing it, nobody's talking about it. And then so he brought out the process of which they are making the beer into the messaging, which the public had never heard about. And I think for like 50 years, they're the, the, the number one beer in America, right? So. Um, I know I butchered that story, but scientific advertising, amazing book to read to go deeper on that and deeper on this concept here. But let me give you an actual example, like real time of a client of mine in the info space. So for example, wholesaling is not new, okay? Not new, been around for a long time. And people have been teaching it and marketing it for a long time. But one of my clients, their name is New Reach, they coined this term called astro flipping which was a new way of wholesaling in which you didn't have to market the sellers, buyers, spend money on ads or any of that stuff. And what they actually were teaching was cold wholesaling or micro flipping, which is a strategy that's been around for a while. Like people have done that, but nobody's really brought it to the surface and talked about it to the general market. And because of that, when they launched, it was a runaway eight figure success. And it's not because, I mean, they're not teaching anything. Um, you know, they're not necessarily bringing anything new they're taking something that already exists but wasn't talked about that is unique and brought it to the surface. So that's how to create a better hook or new opportunity within the ads themselves. And that's what I feel a lot of times is gonna drive most of uh, your growth and your profitability in your ads is your ability to come up with the next big idea or broaden the messaging. But if you broaden the messaging, you also have to have a good hook or new opportunity in there. Okay, so let's move on to the next one, which is adding outbound setters. So I talked about this in the, little, in, the, in the first part, but this is what, when we added outbound setters to call our VSL and webinar opt-ins, it doubled the production of our entire business, okay? So in the example above, these guys have no setters. What they could do is basically have an outbound team, we would call this an MDR team, marketing development reps, which basically takes leads developed by marketing, generated by marketing, and then turns those into consults. So they're calling these people as soon as they opt in. Hopefully within five to 10 minutes, they're getting a contact, okay? And uh, typically what we find is if you add up, if you add these centers in the call opt-ins, like leverage Facebook group, leverage a list, database mine, all this stuff, you can almost two to three X the profitability overnight, okay? So for example, when we first did this, we were running a funnel only through paid traffic, YouTube ads, and when we added in setters, that for the next 30 day period, we doubled. And we didn't spend any more on ads. So all of that doubling minus the setter commission was all profit. Does it make sense? So this is a huge opportunity. I mean, and, and you know, just to kind of give me my, myself a plug here, this is exactly what we help with and we help clients do. But um, it's a massive, massive opportunity in terms of outbound teams. We have about one setter for every closer who calls these opt-in needs constantly. And it's a huge, huge uh, production for us. So next one is effective content marketing and retargeting, okay? A lot of people do this too, but not, most folks not to the extent in which they could. So if you're not doing any content marketing off your paid ads and then you start, it can give you as high as a 30 to 50% lift in most cases. So when I say content marketing, I mean getting your email marketing dialed in, your Facebook group or YouTube channel or both. Uh, retargeting, and then even you can play around, I'm not an expert with these channels, but IG, TikTok, et cetera, those work as well. The thing about 
content marketing is you don't wanna think about it as top of funnel, in my opinion. Let your paid ads be top of funnel. You wanna think about content marketing as nurture, right? So for instance, once the lead's generated but they don't book consult, you have your setters nurturing them and you're also, you have them inside of a Facebook group, you're nurturing them there, you're sending them emails to where it's only a matter of time, right? To where that trust is built, they raise their hand, they want some help and you can get them on a consult and potentially close, okay? The next strategy here that could increase profitability is adding in a back end. okay? So if you teach anything that's make money or B2B, um, really anything that has a financial ROI attached to it or anything that's a B2B offer, to be honest, I really recommend doing a back end that's 2X the price, 2X the time. So if you sell 10K for 90 days, this would be 18K for six months and it would eventually, you could probably increase this to 24K, okay? Now, if you're at 2X the price and 2X the time, and you convert 50% at 2X for the price, 2X the time, then you just doubled your company, okay? Let me repeat that. If you have a back-end offer, let's say you sell 10K for 90 days, and then your back-end is 20K for six months, okay? 2X the price, 2X the time. The terms are the same, keep in mind. Right, because we basically just doubled it and then doubled the time, so that monthly payment, like we talked about earlier, that is the same. So if you do that and then you convert 50% of those people from the front end to the back end, we just doubled the profitability of the entire company. Doubled it, okay? Now, and that means we doubled it without having to spend any more money on ads, so that's a lot of profit there. Now that gives us a huge leg up on our competitors. So even if you convert only 20%, which is super doable, Okay, that's still a 40% lift in revenue. And that revenue is gonna be less costly than the front end revenue you had to generate. So that's another lever that like, as we went into this example, this company up here wasn't utilizing and now they can start utilizing, okay? So let's go to the final one, which is increasing closing ratio and or follow-up deals. So in the above example, the closing ratio is fine, 25% is pretty good, but like my team closes 33%. So, and that's across a big scaled team, which is very hard to achieve. So if I could get them there, I don't know the exact um, metric to it, but let's say you could go from 25% to 30%. I believe that would be, yeah, not a 5% increase in revenue, but a 20%. So let me repeat that. If you can go from 25% to 30% closing ratio, that's not a 5% increase in revenues, that's a 20% increase in revenues. So you see how those incremental shifts, like we talked about with the funnel as well, can mean big output on the other side. And then also at the same time, a huge opportunity is follow-up. So when I was a full-time closer, I would have about 50% of my deals, like one call close or call with, or uh, close within seven days, so a really short sales cycle. And then um, half of my other deals were deals I had to work for months. And keep in mind, what we were selling was a one, one or two call close. So it was a less than a seven day sales cycle in most times. So I would get about half my revenue from there, but then I would get my other half, literally half, which was millions of dollars a year, through like deals I've been working for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine months, right? And people are just constantly in, in touch with, following up with, following up with, following up with relentlessly. And so if I wasn't doing any follow-up at all, I would have been, my production would have been half, okay? And that's where a lot of the people I was on the team with at the time, that's where their production was. And the, only the guys that were doing follow-up and really managing a pipeline and a book of business were the ones doing big, big numbers. They were one call closing, two call closing, in the short sales cycle, the people that were ready, but their money was made on the back end. Most sales teams in the high ticket space, they don't do any follow-up at all. And so if you can get your team to do that, maybe they might not double, but even a 20% lift would be huge. So to wrap this all up, with this example, a lot of folks will come to me and they'll show me numbers like these and they'll say, dude, I need to get on a new channel, start a new offer, whatever, right? When in reality, if we added in a backend offer, did a pricing change, we bumped closing ratio by 5%, we bumped VSL conversion by maybe 5% and you know, so on and so forth, you can see where the profitability in the ROAS starts just creeping up there. And now we have more ceiling for scale. So that really wraps up this video, guys. If you guys want this document, uh, comment document below, how about that? comment document below. We'll get that to you. And uh, that's really it, guys. So hopefully you enjoyed this and I'll see you in the next video.